All right. Psalm 88. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah, to the chief musician set to Mahalath Leonoth, a, com- a contemplation of Heman the Ezra- Ezraite. O Lord, God of my salvation, I've cried out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you, incline your ear to my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength, adrift from the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more and who are cut off from your hand. You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you have afflicted me with all your waves. Selah. You've put away my acquaintances far from me. You've made me an abomination to them. I am shut up, and I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. Shall your loving kindness be declared in the grave or your faithfulness in the place of destruction? Shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But to you I have cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? I've been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. They came around me all day long like water. They engulfed me altogether. Loved one and friend you've put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. Let's pray. O Lord, even as we read this psalm, we are troubled for Heman. We're troubled for what it says. We confess that we greatly need your help. You've been faithful to your people each week. You come here, you speak to them through your word. We ask you to do that again today. And though this psalm causes us difficulty, we pray that it would be an encouragement and a help to us as we walk in this life. So glorify yourself and help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Darkness. Often it's an ominous word. Children are frightened when parents send them to bed in a shadowy room. Accidents happen when light is obscured. Crimes are committed under the cover of darkness. As the calendar moves towards winter, here we are. Nights are longer, and when clouds hide the moon, the result makes our world seem even dimmer. Just a couple of weeks ago, our society took advantage of the threatening nature of darkness to undergird the haunting scenes of Halloween. Have you ever noticed that Halloween lawn displays often look silly during the day, even while they may become ghoulish at night? Oh, there are some really ghoulish ones in my neighborhood. One, one family has an electric chair in front of their house. During the day, it just looks like a skeleton in a chair. At night, it buzzes and lights up and ghoulish. In scripture, darkness often bodes trouble or evil. The first creative act described in Genesis 1 records that God said, let there be light, since darkness was over the face of the deep. Hebrews 12, 18, referring to the deep gloom at Sinai, says that the darkness there was so profound it could be felt. The absence of light has great spiritual significance. Isaiah likens it to prison, both in chapter 42 and in chapter 49. Do you remember the story of Job? In the account of his profound troubles, the idea of darkness appears about 35 times. In the disasters of his life, he metaphorically encountered darkness. Paul tells us that we are to take no part in the works of darkness. He calls our spiritual enemies the powers of darkness, and he asks the question, what communion has light with darkness? And of course, our Lord Jesus as he approached his crucifixion, said, this is the hour of the power of darkness. And you'll remember that during that horrible event, darkness reigned for three hours from noon until 3 p.m. 
normally the brightest hours of the day. Well, here in Psalm 88, Heman the Ezraite describes his own experience using this word. In fact, in the original and in most English translations, the last word that we hear or read is the word darkness. The psalm begins with God, but it ends with this disturbing word. It's not immediately uplifting, but rather it turns our thoughts to unresolved gloom and anguish. Now let's be honest. This is an emotionally charged psalm. To read it any other way misses its power and undermines its usefulness. When you read the commentaries, there's universal agreement that the 88th psalm is the most sorrowful of all the songs in the book. It is the honest cry of a disheartened saint in the midst of melancholy and misery and pain. Now, someone might ask, well, brother, why are you preaching on it? Well, the answer should be obvious. It is inspired scripture. Speaking about the Old Testament, the Apostle Paul says this, whatever things were written before were written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's Romans 15, 4. My desire for you today is that Psalm 88 will assist your endurance and encourage you to have hope. Several commentators point out that this 3,000-year-old inspired poem has been the means of aiding God's people for millennia. And my prayer is that that may be true today for each of us. We might think of the Psalter in these ways, the entire book. If an artist were to paint various psalms in different colors according to their themes, we'd find a wide variety of shades on the canvases. Psalms 1 and 23 might be predominantly green because they portray streams of water running through green pastures. Psalms 2 and 45 and 110 would be golden and purple because they describe messianic royalty. Psalms 22 and 69 and other crucifixion psalms might be crimson, reminding us of the death of the Son of God. But the most common color tone used for the psalms would be blue, since, at least in our culture, blue reflects the realities of lament. Did you know that there are more psalms of lament among the 150 than any other kind? They outnumber the rest. There's more sorrow and complaint in the psalms than there is joy. And these many psalms of lamentation would be blue. And among them, Psalm 88 would be the deepest possible hue of midnight blue, only one shade away from black. Or, since the psalms are intended to be sung, we might conjecture about appropriate tunes for them. Many comforting psalms, such as 23 or 91 and 92, could have pleasant melodies and harmonies to support their encouraging words. The royal psalms might incorporate fanfares. The final five psalms, 146 through 150, should reflect the jubilant and triumphant scene portrayed in Revelation 4 and 5. These would be written in a minor key, a major key, with all the beauty and resolution of that kind of music. But once again, the largest segment of psalms, the laments, should be different. The appropriate musical setting for most of them would be a dominant minor key and perhaps a slow tempo with melancholic and evocative arrangements, making them beautiful in themselves but contemplative. Earlier this morning, we sang the doxology and it ended with an amen. It's an old practice. In many hymnals that you might pick up today, there's still an amen at the end of the hymns. And it's interesting that when the tune is written in a minor key, almost always it's resolved into a major key by the use of the amen. That's the way of saying there is hope even when there is sadness. Now, if this principle were to be applied to the Psalms, many of them would be set to a minor key, moving to a major key at the end. But Psalm 80, it is different. Not only would it be written in a minor key, Its musical setting would be discordant and perhaps even harsh, and it would not naturally resolve into a major key. Rather, it would leave us waiting for something else, some musical element to bring us out of the depths. Because Psalm 88 is a cry from the depths. Notice again with me 
several of the verses. Verses 3 and 4. I am counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm sorry. My soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to the grave. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. Look at verse 6. You've laid me in the lowest pit. Verses 8 and 9. You put away my acquaintances far from me. You've made me an abomination to them. I am shut up. I cannot get out. My eye wastes away because of affliction. Heman the Ezraite writes from the lowest place. Now, you're probably familiar with the famous European medieval castles, the ancient dwellings of powerful kings and princes and dukes. These great buildings are surrounded by high walls and battlements, sometimes by moats, only accessed by a drawbridge. The castle was a place of power and authority, and its size and strength reflected the rank in society that was held by its lord. We know that many of these castles had dungeons, dark underground rooms where enemies or criminals might be placed for punishment. It's not unusual to watch a movie set in a medieval fortress and see a scene that's filmed in a dungeon. But often the dungeon was not the most horrible place in the castle for an out-of-favor person to be abandoned. There was another site, much worse than any dungeon could possibly be. Usually, at the lowest point of the deepest dungeon, there would be a metal grate in the floor. It might look to us like a sewer cover, but it was not. It had hinges on one side and a great locking me mechanism on the opposite side, and it marked the spot of an oubliette. An oubliette was a small chamber, often no wider than the space a human body would take while standing, maybe this big, and it would be about eight or 10 feet deep. Being at the very foundation of the castle, all manner of runoff would come through the grate and puddle at the bottom. It would have been a disgusting, terrible, unsanitary place. And into this dark, tiny, dark, deep space, someone would be dropped and most frequently left to die. There was no light, no room to move, no escape. The name for this lowest and worst prison is French, oubliette. It comes from the verb oublier, which means to forget, and it describes the hopeless situation of anyone placed there. No food, no water, no human companionship, no rest. The prisoner was forgotten, left to die alone, and deprived of all comfort. The only thing the prisoner could do while in the oubliette was to cry out for mercy. Would anyone hear? Would anyone respond, help, over and over, so long as there was life and breath, help, have mercy, save me? Well, in many ways, Heman the Ezraite describes his life in these terms. We don't find him in a physical oubliette in the lowest place in a dungeon, but his language very much describes this kind of experience. Let me remind you, he says things like this, I'm counted with those who go down to the pit, You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. I'm shut up, and I cannot get out. Heman the Ezraite was in God's oubliette. Now, what are we to make of this? How shall we understand and apply his experience? That's our task today. So let me open up this psalm in a couple of different ways. First, let's think about the psalm and about its author, Heman, the Ezraite, because there are clues that help us. The place of Psalm 88 in the book of Psalms and the information that's provided to us in the superscription. So let's think in these terms. Psalm 88 in the book of Psalms. The 150 Psalms in this collection have not been placed together randomly. They're not arranged simply by authorship nor by chronology but rather they're placed into five books which speak primarily about David and his kingdom. The first 41 Psalms, book one, largely though not exclusively tell us about David's life and experiences before coming to the throne. The second book, Psalms 42 through 72, contemplate the kingdom at its high point, culminating in Psalm 72 in Solomon's Psalm of praise. But the third book, 73 through 89, turns in a different direction, for it speaks of the failure of the Davidic kingship because of the sins of the kings and of the people. 
The fourth book, beginning with the Psalm of Moses, the man of God, Psalm 90, and running through 106, turns the reader away from earthly kings to contemplate the only true and righteous king for God's people, who is the Lord himself. And the final book, Psalms 107 through 150, lead the reader to praise the God of heaven and earth in all his glory. Well, our psalm is in the third book of Psalms. Palmer Robertson, in his excellent book, The Flow of the Psalms, gave this third book the title, Devastation. For it honestly depicts the trouble that came from the heavy, heavy chastening hand of God. In some cases, it reveals the sins of believers, in others, the sins of the nation, but it honestly portrays the consequences of putting one's trust in human princes. The next to the last psalm in this book is 88, and it carries forward this theme. It says, life in this world is hard, even for those who know and love the Lord. They must endure God's chastisements, and sometimes they do so for reasons beyond our understanding. It shouldn't surprise us that this is the lowest point in the entire Psalter, because from here, one can only look up and go up. Now, look at the superscription of the psalm. Notice what's placed there. It gives us help. And there are several things to, to notice. The first portion of the superscription, which says, a song, a psalm of the sons of Korah, to the chief musician set to Mahalath Leonoth, gives us information. This poem was intended to be used in public worship. The sons of Korah were a guild of musicians responsible for leading worship in the temple in Jerusalem along with the chief musician. And these untranslated Hebrew words are probably the name of the tune that was to be used when God's people came together in worship and sang this song. We're told that this is a contemplation. Maybe your translation doesn't give an English word. It simply says maskil. The Hebrew word seems to suggest meditation or instruction. That is, we are meant to think deeply about the contents of the psalm. And then we're told that the author is identified as Heman the Ezraite. Ezraite is his family name, like your last name, your surname. Heman is his first name, and it means, when translated into English, it means faithful. That's his given name. And while he appears only here in the psalms, we find him in other places in Scripture, appointed to serve under David in the worship of the temple. In 1 Chronicles 25.5, he is said to be a seer in the things of God. He was a man of faith and prominent in the spiritual life of Israel. The Lord chose him to be an instrument of the inspiration of Scripture. And today we're able to enter into his experience. So what do we have? We have a psalm written by a prominent spiritual leader, intended for public worship for the purpose of instructing us in one of God's ways with his people. That's what this psalm is about. Now, if you look closely, it can be divided quite simply. Verses 1 and 2 are an example of the classic beginning of a psalm of lament. They begin with a cry to God, directly addressing him with great urgency. Then in verses 3 through 5, there is a summary of Heman's cry, and verses 6 through 18 pick up the theme and describe it in greater detail. So what do we find in the contents of the psalm? Well, first we can say this. Our psalmist has been and continues to be in agony. Like a man dropped into an oubliette, he cries out to God day and night using the language of faith. Lord, God of my salvation, he calls his master to hear and respond. I wonder, can you hear the complaint in his voice? He shouted his plea to the Lord over and over again, and yet it seems that there has been no reply. He's still trapped in the pit. He's unable to be free. He's enduring great pain and sorrow. Heman is before the Lord. He understands that God is present in all places. And yet the Lord is silent. Where is the Lord? Where is the God of my salvation? O oh Lord, hear me. O oh God, save me. I think we must read these words with the emotion that would have been present in Heman's life. Despite the delay and continued agony, this man's faith has not weakened. 
He trusts that the Lord will hear him and will save him from his prison of misery. Look with me at verses 3 through 5. Heman's summary of trouble. It's very moving. My soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to the grave. I'm counted with those who go down to the pit. I'm like a man who has no strength, adrift among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, and who are cut off from your hand. In both soul and body, he feels the depths of pain. He's almost like a walking corpse, and his soul might as well be dead. Now, we might ask the question, what specifically is Heman's affliction? What, what was it that caused him to write, to experience these things and write as he did? Was it some kind of physical disease? Did he suffer a profound loss, such as the death of a spouse or a loved one? Did, did he encounter a Judas in his life? Was he betrayed by a trusted friend? Well, the honest answer is, we don't know, and we can't tell. Much of the language in this song is symbolic or metaphorical. There are some who speculate that perhaps he was enduring one of the skin diseases such as leprosy that required physical separation from family and friends. I don't find that very convincing because it relies on the most circumstantial bits of evidence. Certainly these diseases could produce the kind of lament we find here, but to state that this is Heman's affliction presses the evidence beyond credibility. The fact that our psalm, along with the other mentions of Heman in the Old Testament, does not describe a specific cause of suffering is actually to our benefit. If this psalm were to identify a particular cause, we might be tempted to limit its usefulness to those who endure a similar circumstance. But because it's open-ended, the psalm becomes a means of help for every believer who faces deep and profound troubles in life. Brothers and sisters, this is a universal description of deep pain among God's faithful people. It is for you, and it is for me. It was written for our assistance. If we look at the longer section, verses 6 through 18, there are several things that we need to note. For example, this section is bracketed by the idea of darkness. Look at verse 6, and then look at verse 18. You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Verse 18, loved one and friend, you've put far from me and my acquaintances into darkness. In verse 6, the Lord metaphorically places Heman in the oubliette, in utter darkness. And the following verses, 7 through 17, should be read under this dark shadow. We need to put that into our mind and read them like that. And verse 18 concludes with a similar thought, but it is difficult to translate. Commentators acknowledge that the final few words of Psalm 88 are challenging. I read to you the New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the ESV render it similarly, but we ask the question, what does this mean? My acquaintances into darkness. What does that mean? Is it that from Heman's perspective, his loved ones and friends have been taken away so that he cannot see or hear them? Well, that would seem to be the sense. But if you have an ESV, you'll notice that there's a very interesting footnote attached to the end of this verse. And it suggests another way to translate it, these difficult Hebrew words, and it makes a great deal of sense to me in this alternate rendering, especially in this context. That footnote says this, the, the alternate translation it gives, darkness has become my only companion. Now, I would prefer to keep the word order of the original and say, my only companion is darkness, because that's the final word of the psalm in Hebrew, but this translation fits the psalm very well. As he ends the psalm, Heman's prayer has not yet been answered. He waits for the Lord in the depth of the shadow of the oubliette, and stands as an example to us of continued cries and pleas to the Lord for help in the midst of the most difficult trouble. Brothers and sisters, that in itself should encourage us. Heman, remember his name means faithful. Heman does not give in to utter despair and fall into silence. Rather, he constantly raises his voice to heaven to seek help and deliverance. Now, I, I want to do something that's dangerous for preachers to do. I'd like to speculate just for a moment. Can't prove this to you from scripture, but I want to speculate just for a moment. Is it possible 
that the inclusion of Psalm 88 in the book of Psalms, and therefore in the word of God, implies that at some point the Lord did answer Heman's cry. Because someone, the person who put together the Psalter, recognized the inspired nature of this poem and incorporated it right here into the third book of Psalms. That's exactly the place that it belongs. The language that is used in the psalm is evocative and consistently depicts a believer in great distress. He's alone. He's imprisoned. He wonders if death is nearby. He repeatedly emphasizes calling on God. Look at the latter part of verse 9. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands. Verse 13, but to you I've cried out, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer comes before you. Verse 14, Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? These are the words of a child in great danger pleading for a parent to come for help. In verse 12, Heman sounds like a man who wishes to continue leading worship. Remember what we said about him. David chose him for that purpose. Verse 12, shall your wonders be known in the dark and your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? We need to remember that the tabernacle and later the temple was the place of adoration, not of darkness or forgetfulness. It was in the temple that the wonders of God were made known. Twice in the psalm, Heman uses that Hebrew word that's usually not translated, selah. It probably means pause and meditate. And he wants us to think about his trouble. The pictures are frightening. Look again at verses 6 and 7. You've laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the depths. Your wrath lies heavy upon me. You've afflicted me with all your waves. Selah. Now, we have mixed metaphors here. A pit and the depths and waves and breakers. These are drowning him. Verses, the latter part of verse 9 and verse 10 contemplates death. Lord, I've called daily upon you. I've stretched out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise you? Selah. He wants us to think about this. I hope that you're thinking deeply about what happens here. We also need to notice that Heman tells us that his sorrow originates with the hand of God. Over and over again, verse 6, you have laid me in the lowest pit. Verse 7, your wrath lies heavy upon me. You have afflicted me. Verse 8, you have put away my acquaintances far from me. Verse 14, Lord, why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? Verse 15, I've been afflicted and ready to die from my youth. I suffer your terrors. I am distraught. Verse 16, your fierce wrath has gone over me. Your terrors have cut me off. And verse 18, loved one and friend, you have put far from me. Now, Heman's trouble is not a result of his own sin, but rather the Lord's providential way in his life. There are other psalms in this third book that speak of affliction because of sin. Maybe you remember Psalm 73 where Asaph says, My my feet had almost slipped and I'd almost stumbled when I envied the prosperity of the wicked. That's his, his confession. His trouble was a result of his sin. But there's no hint of this here. Heman is like Job or Paul or even our Lord Jesus who endured the deepest possible suffering as he faced the horror of the cross. We read that earlier. For his own purposes, the good Lord who loves his people sends some of them into the darkest and deepest trouble. And he gives them this psalm. And other examples such as Job and Paul and the believers in the book of Hebrews and our Lord Jesus to help them. We've heard Paul's voice already today. He was not afraid to admit that he despaired even of life in the midst of his affliction. The Hebrew Christians endured a great struggle with sufferings and they were reminded that some were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Language from Hebrews 11. Even of our sinless Savior, it is said, In the days of his flesh, 
when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. You see, Psalm 88 is a part of a great theme of Scripture. We are strangers and aliens in this world, and life here is full of trouble. We are called to endure suffering all the while crying out to the Lord for deliverance. Our rest and our comfort is not in this present evil age, but rather it is in the world to come. Heman's experience is a reminder to us that we should expect trouble now. It weans us from the love of the world and turns our attention to heaven and to God who sits on his throne. Now, we might ask this question. Is there any light in this psalm, a psalm about darkness? And the answer is, yes, indeed. In fact, we've already noticed much of it. The fact that this psalm is included in the canon of Scripture tells us that the Lord wants us to know and to understand, to contemplate and be instructed by its words. But that's not all that we have. Here is a man whose name is Faithful, addressing the covenant Lord, Yahweh, by his most intimate appellation, a name that was revealed only to Israel, and he calls him the God of his salvation, seeking help in trouble. Though faithful is in God's oubliette, he never forgets his God. Three times in the psalm, he uses the word Lord in uppercase letters, Yahweh, Jehovah, a reminder that he is in covenant with God and that the one who is always faithful, greater than any human commitment, listens and hears. In a medieval dungeon oubliette, the cries of the prisoner would go unheeded. The guards would ignore. The prince was so far removed from the dungeon that he would never hear the fervent pleas of the prisoner. But Heman knows that the Lord will hear, though he may delay in his response. The psalmist must continue to cry to the great king, trusting that at the right time he will hear and he will deliver. And even if the king keeps him in the oubliette until death, a better hope awaits. Well, what should we say about Psalm 88? There are several important things, observations that we ought to make from this psalm. The first one is this. This psalm validates the experience of believers who endure suffering. It is a genuine Christian experience. And I want you to think about this with me for a moment. I can hear someone say, but brother, that was the Old Testament. We live under the New Covenant. We have the Spirit who produces joy. Well, while it's certainly true that we live under the New Covenant and we have received the Spirit who works joy in us, this in no way negates the realities of Psalm 88. Consider these facts with me. We've already heard Paul's words from Romans 15, which tell us that the writings of the Old Testament are given for our benefit. We must remember that for much of the apostolic era, the only scripture available was the Old Testament. And it is the inspired, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction instruction and righteousness book that God has given to us. My friends, all God's word belongs to us, and we need it in its fullness. In fact, I'm more convinced of this than ever, and I hope that you are as well. Think about this also. We've noted the fact that many New Testament believers suffer, endured suffering similar to Heman's. This is not an isolated Old Testament experience, but rather one vignette in a tapestry that extends from Genesis to Revelation. Have you ever noticed in Revelation 6 how even the saints in heaven know sorrow? Listen to these words. John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. See, it's not until the end, it's not until the final resurrection that God will wipe away every tear 
from our eyes. I fear that we've been too easily and readily deceived by prosperity preachers into thinking that the life of Christ's disciples is one of continuous and increasing comfort and joy. But the Bible tells a different story. We should expect trouble in this life. And sometimes it will be just as profound as Heman's. Brother or sister, this means that when you face a circumstance like this, critical illness, or bereavement, or abandonment, or betrayal, or any other dark providence, this is not an indication that you've sinned, but rather it's an opportunity, though painful it may be, to draw near to God through texts like Psalm 88. Think about it like this. Would you be so bold simply by yourself to address God in the terms that Heman uses here? I don't think I would. But most of us would be quite reluctant. But remember this, a song, a psalm for public worship, a prayer to God for deliverance is given to you. You may take these very words and bring them before the Lord. You may say, Lord, God of my salvation, hear the words you have given to me. Why have you laid me in the lowest pit? Why do you cast off my soul? Why do you hide your face from me? And be comforted by the fact that the Lord is glad to hear his own word coming from the lips of his people. One wonders if Psalm 88 might have been on the lips of Jesus when he was in Gethsemane. The Psalms were certainly his prayer book, and so it may be the case that this is what he prayed. Certainly both Mark and Luke seem to have Psalm 88 in mind when they describe the events of the crucifixion. In any case, I want you to be comforted by this psalm. Receive its instruction, and through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, have hope even in the midst of great darkness. Secondly, there's an important word here for those of us who do not endure sufferings like Heman's. Did you notice, as we read through the psalm, how he complains of being alone, of his companions being far from him? Verse 8. You've put away my acquaintances far from me. Verse 18, loved one and friend you've put far from me. And even the ending, as was retranslated by the ESV, my only companion is darkness. The Oubliette is solitary confinement at its its extreme. Now, we don't know the circumstances of Heman's separation from friend and loved one, but we must learn from his isolation. Christian love calls us to be companions to brothers and sisters in their time of darkness. We have obligations to them. On the one hand, we must overcome our tendency to think of trials as punishments and keep our distance from those who endure them. We're taught to weep with those who weep. And this is the time and place where we must do this. The false doctrine which denies sorrow in the Christian life and promotes prosperity and happiness must be rejected, rooted out of your thinking. Have compassion on sisters and brothers who endure hardships, difficulties, and sufferings. In a Christian church, we have obligations to one another. We ought to make it our aim to see that no believer we know endures suffering alone, as did Heman. So far as it is within our power, let us comfort and encourage one another. Speak a word of love. To quote from the Pilgrim's Progress, remind your friend of the key of promise in order to overcome giant despair and pray for his or her deliverance. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, love suffers long and is kind. We don't actually have an English word that can translate exactly what Paul says because when we say love is kind, it sounds like an attribute of love. That's not his point. It's a verb. Love kindness is, not an English word, but it makes the point. Love acts kindly. That's what true love does. It acts according to the needs of others, seeking to aid them in their troubles. I know that you do this, but brothers and sisters, we can never do it enough. Let us love one another, help each other in the midst of our struggles. Thirdly, let's think about how Psalm 88 points us to Christ and his gospel. We've stated that the book of Psalms was Jesus' prayer book. God in his kindness prepared everything for his son, 
and it served him in many ways. If Martin Luther is correct in saying that all of the Psalms are about Jesus, may we read it as his prayer? Think with me about the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus knew and understood the horror that was before him. Listen to how Matthew describes the scene. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. He took with him Peter and two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me, Unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Much of what Matthew describes to us here is reminiscent of our psalm. We're told that Jesus was sorrowful and deeply distressed, even to the point of death. He was profoundly exercised in his soul by the dread of the events immediately before him. Who could do otherwise? He knew that the physical sufferings of crucifixion would be horrible, but even more so, that facing the wrath of God against sin, draining the cup of wrath to the dregs would be the greatest trial anyone could ever know. He did not go to Calvary unaware. He was fully conscious of everything he would encounter. But as he comes to the garden, he's accompanied by his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. They were brought to aid him. What did they do? They fell asleep, and they left him alone. Three times he prayed alone. We might even go to the, beyond the garden and consider the entire experience of his ordeal. Abandoned by friends, exhausted and without sleep, beaten by enemies, finally crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Without diminishing human sorrow in any way, we might read Psalm 88 as a transcript of Jesus' experience as he walked the road towards Calvary and endured the cross. Brothers and sisters, this gives us much hope. It reminds us of a great truth. Hear these words from Hebrews. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you pray Psalm 88, you come to God by way of an intercessor who has experienced deeper and darker sorrow than you have ever known. And because of this, he is sympathetic with your trouble. He knows, he understands, he hears. And so you may come boldly into the throne room of heaven, bring your request before the majestic throne of grace, and there find mercy, the cry of one in the oubliette, and find grace to help in your time of need. Now, this is not a promise of immediate resolution, but of divine assistance. The Savior will give you grace to endure, and you will find help. You are not alone. You have loved ones and friends, but even better, you have a compassionate high priest and the ear of the Lord of heaven and earth when you cry out to him in your trouble. Finally, let me remind you of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He endured the cross, despising its shame, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, 
that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you bowed the knee to Jesus Christ? You will now or at the last day. But I can assure you, and there are many present today who can agree with me, he is a wonderful Savior, he's a compassionate Redeemer, and he's a forgiving Lord. He took our sin upon himself, he endured the wrath of God so that we might be forgiven. He died so that we might have life, and he gives everything freely to all who will place their faith in him. So I ask you, if you're not yet a believer, why would you wait? If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I ask you, will you confess and will you believe? Psalm 88 is dark. There's no denying this fact. As we've seen, it has some light. And when set in the context of the whole of Scripture, the darkness begins to dissipate. God's oubliette is undoubtedly a difficult place to be, and none of us should want to be there. Even Jesus asked the Lord to take it from him. But Psalm 88 may also be encouraging. It reminds us that we need the Lord, and that he hears us, even when we cry out to him in the darkest moments of life. The color tone of the psalm might be the deepest shade of blue, and the tune might be in a dissonant minor key, but there is light, And there is melody for those who will listen. Glory to God. Amen. Let's pray. O Lord, we thank you for the honesty that we find in Scripture. That it reveals to us experiences we don't want to endure, but sometimes you call us to, and you give us the remedies, you give us the help. You turn our eyes heavenward so that we can trust in you. We ask that we might be able to pray Psalm 88 with Heman the Ezraite, that we would be faithful like him, and that you would be glorified in our lives. Write these words on our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name.